So given that you also were on channels like the Food Network and shows like Job, um, do you think that that really helped your branding and your positioning in the industry? You know, what's funny is, so one of my principal's kid's friends noticed me when I was cooking in the kitchen, like, oh, hey, I know him from Job. Welcome to the Private Chef Podcast, serving the 1%. I'm your host, Hannes Hedgy. And on our show, we speak to the best chefs, how they honed in on their skills to excel in the industry and what it takes to work as a private chef for some of the most exclusive clients in the world. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Sis Kamimura. He's a original New Yorker, even so his parents are from Tokyo. But he spent all of his life in the US, traveling all over, working with people like Wolfgang Puck. And he was even competing with Bobby Flay. He will tell us all about it. So welcome to the show, Sis. <laughs> Thank you, Hannes. I appreciate that. Thank you for that introduction. But yeah, um, I've been here uh, all my life, uh, starting with New York and back in New York now uh, to actually uh, to take a private chef job. I was in Washington before this a um, few years back, and then I came here to take a private position, which was my first uh, coming back to New York City. So where did your interest in food come from? Was it something that was uh, given in your household from your parents? Or where did the curiosity and the interest in culinary came from? Oh, very good question. So my mom, um, when I was growing up, was a caterer. So she had a partner, a friend of hers, that um, they did Japanese uh, food catering here in Westchester County, New York. And that's where I grew up. And um, subsequently, when I was in high school, too, uh, My mom and their partners, uh, my dad too, they owned a Japanese grocery store called Shinsendo, which means uh, new and fresh store um, in Westchester County. So food has been always a part of my life and uh, they definitely had something to do with it. Um, and professionally, I started getting into it because um, I was going to actually go to college and, and play a little college football, but that wasn't in, in the cards. And then um, my mom's partner she had a cooking class. And so she had all these brochures of cooking schools, uh, CIA, um, obviously French Culinary Institute, um, California Cooking Academy. Um, I ended up actually going to the French Culinary Institute um, because it was the shortest program, number one. And I didn't have any professional experience before, which was a prerequisite to go to CIA and getting out of high school. I'm like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to work professionally to go professional. So I took the shortest route and it was Manhattan was train right away. So That's kind of how it all started. So then um, how did you work from going to culinary school to eventually, you know, competing with Bobby Flay on TV? I mean, there's, there's a big gap in between there. How, how did you experience that journey becoming such a skilled chef that you not only became a private chef, but also made it on the Food Network? Yes. Yeah, so it's, I mean, all journeys are quite interesting. Mine's uh, long. Yeah, I started, so I'm one of the rare ones. It's actually funny. I, I met with a, a German chef that I taught at French Connery a while back. And I told him I graduated in 92. He's like, oh, well, you're a dinosaur. I'm like, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, Mark Bauer was his name. But I, I started <laughs> very early and right out of high school, which is common for most people in, in Europe. Um, not so common for the people in the US. Uh, the people that I went to school were much more, you know, second uh, careers, third careers. But um, I get the journey starts in New York. And, um, I was at a time where, you know, school was inexpensive, like culinary school was 10 grand. And the story is basically, I was cooking in some French restaurants and I basically, I was getting yelled at every day. So like, who wants to do this? Right. So you have to set up goals for yourself. And this will be like in the future part, future says understands this, but I think a lot of us have to set these goals up. So my goal at the point in time was like, okay, it's not unlike football where you're getting yelled at. And But as you're getting yelled at, you like don't want to get yelled at, but you, you kind of feel like either it makes you or breaks you. It comes a point, it's like, okay, am I going to keep doing this or what? So just do what they say and just try to be better. So every day I'd be better or every day I try not to get yelled at for the same thing. So those are the mini goals. Um, the greater goal was that I could pay my student loan off because you know I knew everybody that was going to college was paying a lot of loans. This is only 10,000. So I could see, okay, I'm making whatever minimum wage a little bit over. I can see the end of the path. And so at the end of the day, I told myself, if I don't like this, I'm not a cook for myself. I have an appreciation for food. I've only done six months. You know, I, I made it logical. But as you go forward with it, 
I enjoyed the cooking aspect of it. Because you don't know. I mean, I guess some people know that they're good at it or not. But I started with no professional experience. Just basically, okay, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to go do this. Um, you know, I saw the magazines at the time as Tom Colicchio, who is Mondrian. And that, that's who was, I mean, this is my era. And those are the people that are making the waves. So you're looking at this stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm in Manhattan. And, and you start realizing there's this whole subculture. So when I was working, I was working for a chef named Matthew Kenny, who now does a lot of vegan food. And back in the day, he just uh, had a restaurant called uh, Banana Cafe. And so this is one of the bigger jobs. I worked in some smaller ones, like the Terrytown Hilton and stuff. And it just it wasn't the feel because it was like making hamburgers and, you know, which is nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, I learned one cool technique there. Um, you know, we did you like had a few thousand eggs Benedict, you know, so you spray like the egg muffin tins and then you steam them and then you drop them in the ice bath. I mean, it goes pretty quick, <laughs> but, um, you know, but we had all these guys traveling, you know, so one guy got, you know, was the, was the assistant catering chef at the Essex house and he was in Westchester. So what's great about it. And I think still now, but during the time, there's a lot of mentors. So what's interesting enough, and I, you know, I'm going to hit these little spots cause I can talk a mile a minute, but Along the way, there are these mentors that came up. So if it weren't for some of these people, and none of them stuck around that long, but just saying, okay, well, this, or when I grew up, my mom made these dumplings. And so, you know, meaning American dumplings, which I never saw before, but they're like canoodles. But here I was like, oh, okay, I've never seen this before. So all these little things add up to something like, wow, I've never seen this before. Oh, you could do this. Or working with the personalities in the front of the house. So at every turn, even though you're getting yelled at, you're like, wow, maybe this is something else I can do. And maybe something else I can learn. <laughs> why you're not getting yelled at. Um, but then after a while, I, I realized, okay, um, especially in Manhattan, I was getting good. I was making line positions. You know, I was making it up to the line. People were quitting. Uh, you know, a bad review or a mediocre review comes out. Some people leave. Some people, a new restaurant opens up. So at the time, like, um, you know, Lawn Toronto was opening up something new. So everybody wanted to go there. Um, but, you know, once you start realizing that you have some aptitude towards it, and you meet some good people. I think that's kind of where my journey started happening. Um, so, you know, and then everybody starts talking about, you know, like any other position, but I think food's a little bit different where emotionally, a lot of these people have journeys. So you meet a lot of people in different walks of life. So when I'm like, you know, 18, I'm meeting people that are in the thirties. Um, um, and also people in their fifties and, and so, you know, like, oh, I would love to do what they're doing. Or they talked about Alice Waters when you're in New York and the Shape of East thing, which, you know, as a new cook, I have no idea what's, what that is. But these people are like, oh, the produce, it's warm. You know, it's their garbage is what we use in New York kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, it sounds like magic. Um, but then you also see these, you know, 57, 60-year-old drinking Jack Johnny Walker out of the locker room. And I'm like, okay, that's what I don't want to be doing yeah. <laughs> at your 60 line cooking, you know, my life. And they've garnered some respect because they've worked at like Lakote Basque and all these, you know, work with Rashu and all these guys that are like legendary. But, you know, it comes a time where, you know, you're seeing the turn of the guard a little bit. Um, and then you see some, you know, hot shots and especially in Manhattan, you know, you're seeing uh, new guys come in and everything's trying to change and everything's always trying to change. But that was kind of the beginning of the journey. And one of the things that combined it was someone that was a mentor that also, um, saw some promise and say, Hey, why don't you go to California? So basically worked in Manhattan for a few months and I uh, know for a few years and then ended up in California in 97 and uh, San Francisco. And so got to see a little bit of that stuff firsthand, you know? So that's probably a good shift, no? Like you yeah. go all the way from New York to California. It's a completely different atmosphere and attitude over there. Yeah. The, it was um, definitely different. I mean, being in New York all that time and, and thinking, you know, New York's the culinary center, which in a lot of ways it, it is for certain things. Um, but then when you go to the West Coast, completely different shift where you are seeing some New Yorkers that, have, that are out there and embracing that. Um, but it's a different feel. So you're getting, you know, lamb from Sonoma. You've got the chicken guy bringing eggs and chicken. Um, We had a van back there where they'd go to the airport to pick up a whole yellowfin tuna. So we had actually, you know, so that was a Wolfgang restaurant where I first started, uh, went to. It's called Post Trio, uh, which is now closed. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I was the last chef there, but it happened during the financial crisis. So that's a whole other reason why I segue into other things. But um, in that point in time, when you're seeing all this produce come to the door, and it really is spectacular, and right? you're seeing whole lambs butchered, and then you're understanding 
wow, when you're in New York, like a lot of the stuff doesn't happen just because of what it is. Um, so it kind of took back to another point in time where I'm like, oh, why did why do you guys do this? And it's like, oh, because of Wolfgang. He worked at uh, you know, um Oste de Beaumanier, and they always had their spring lambs, and you know, in France, they freeze a lot, you know, that's their signature. It's kind of a was a dirty word back then in, in California freezing, but in Europe, they you know they do it well. Um, but anyway, the whole lambs and things, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, people are always surprised when they think that when they go to like a three Michelin star restaurant, that everything is fresh, mm -hmm. and and there's there's like not a single Michelin star restaurant where we didn't have a big freeze. <laughs> yeah, no, it's you know, I mean, I got to applaud. I mean, I haven't some of the places that are foraging, doing stuff, but and it comes a point in time where there's nothing there. Like. I'm pretty in, you know, in touch with the local growers. Like in, and out here in, you know, New York, out in the East End, there's good produce, but you know, tomatoes, you know, happen a little bit. They're still happening, but it takes a while for them to to get to the point where you want stuff that's local. When you get a bad rain and stuff. I mean, I, and I God, God love those people that are going exactly straight from what's going on out there. But there's so many restaurants that even tout that. That's not even. That's not not the truth. You can't. But I think that's an interesting part of you know writing menus too of using what's around or making accessible same in the private chef industry right you can't when you write a menu you don't want to promise something you can't find or have so let's make sure i can get it and on the on the flip side sometimes the demand is something that you can't get in a timely manner and then you gotta you gotta find a good a good argument or a good uh, different product <laughs> <laughs> exactly something that's similar oh, it tastes kind of like this and you know we were doing that especially with chinese chinese food so uh, for water chestnut i substitute like jicama Because it's much more easier to find than a freshwater yeah. chestnut. And then we're doing green papaya, and we're doing. Uh, my buddy was doing turnips, like as as a green papaya substitute, and just making it shape. So you know, you gotta you gotta find your ways around these. Yeah. I mean, those are minor sort of adjustments, but California was was a really eye opening experience in, in a lot of good ways. Weather's beautiful, Northern California. Then you know you get to see Napa Valley, so it's like. The wine country, you know, the wine on the menu is very important. And, you know, there's a lot of history going on with it. American history also, but also food history. You know, you've got some European chefs there as well. So, yeah, it was a great time in the 90s. And working for Wolfgang was great. And obviously, you know, other great restaurants were there too. Jeremiah Tower had stars in the, in the day. That was the competition. And, and you check out all these other restaurants. But that was a, a great time being in California. So when did you kind of shift into the private sector? And maybe what would give you the initial push to go there from, you know, this kind of more maybe stressful restaurant environments that you were in? Yeah. So I guess I think the number one thing is is family and kids. So that's when a subtle shift started to happen where it's, you know, I want to spend more time on my kids. And it's my upbringing too, because my dad worked a lot. Like he had that Japanese grocery store and he died of cancer and when he was 57, I think. So kind of, you know, we we're talking earlier, Hannes and I were talking about, you know, um, he was talking about some German chefs, um, you know, unfortunately passing away at an early age and 57 was the number he gave. And I think that's, that's the number my dad was in. And I was cooking at the time and I was in San Francisco, but him being old school Japanese, he never told me that he was that sick. And that's so funny. My parents like, oh, they didn't want to bother me with it. And they were seeing I was doing well in my career. I'm doing California. I'm, I'm living on my own. Um, so that was one of the things, but it also brought me back to when I was younger because, you know, I played football and part of the thing, I always wanted my dad just to be there, watch my games, but he was always working. And so, you know, it kind of, that, that kind of, you know, so, you know, it bothers you as, as a kid or you're growing up, like, okay, I wish I had more time, but then life goes on. You don't think your parents are going to die that young. So you're like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm in California. I'm working. Everything's great. And then, um, you know, I come back home. And he passes away. There's a little bit more to the story, but yeah, but basically, you know, I made peace with all everything, but that's the first inkling of that going, wow, you know, it can happen anytime, but I'm still young. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to keep, I just started my career, um, you know, then went to Los Angeles and, and working hard, but it's when you start thinking about family. So I started segueing into it because through that, that journey, I've worked, you know, like I said, for some Michelin star guys as their executive chef, mostly in the West coast and for Wolfgang, for Michael Mina, for Terrence Brennan in Seattle, Washington. And then I started the last big position I was doing was the Seahawks as the executive chef of the stadium. But one of the reasons like you're, it never ends, like it never stops. Right. And as good as you get at doing one thing, you're always doing something else. So, you know, whether you're managing people, HR, budgets, marketing, there's always something as a chef that's like health department, that's, that's gonna like kind of get in, get in the way. But I started really thinking about it because 
you know, friends of mine, most of them that I worked at Spago with in Los Angeles, they ended up working in the private sector. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. They would tell me stories. When today, oh, I'm, I'm actually off this week, but I'm doing a party with this person. And they would find another job easily, actually through the network. If you did well, then they say, oh, I'm going to refer you to this person. So, you know, the list goes on, the celebrities that were doing, and, and some were terrible. And then the easy part is like, you knew you wouldn't work for those people, especially if you trusted the people that you listened to. Um, and it's a whole other ball game. But anyway, a position came up and I was talking about it for years, but they, the good people that you wanted to work for those positions for those individuals or families don't come up so often. So I was still in the West coast and I got a call from my buddy from the West coast that I worked with as a sous chef together. And he's like, well, do you want to move back to New York? And actually I was considering at the time and I'm like, yeah, what's the job in town? He's like, oh, working for my boss, but he needs someone else in Manhattan who want to go back home and won't pay for this and that and all that stuff. And he gave me the whole thing. I'm like, okay, great. So I trained within Los Angeles while this person was away for like two months. Got all his favorites and this person's favorites and the recipes and things and took some video and it was a great time. Um, so that was, you know, how I made it to the first job of a high profile person doing that. And it's through the connection, through the network, you know, yeah. obviously your tastings and all that stuff. But honestly, like if, if the other house staff don't want you to have the job, it can be difficult because it's a whole other part of the job. But I knew all the people, it was nice. Um, and it worked out great. But what led me to that moment was, you know, all the experiences I've had before, and I think it's true for most things and looking and reflecting on it, like what becomes important. And it's also in the private chef industry, as I've been working for other people, um, other clients, what has become important working for those clients for both them and myself. But I've seen a lot of situations with a lot of my friends, there's, a, there's always a, a time where there's a fork in the road. And then both parties decide what could be best. And some people have been let go or left and then come back and work with the same person a year later. And then 16 years later, they're all happy. So I think everybody kind of goes through the decisions at every juncture of their career. Um, but definitely mine was family uh, because I wasn't spending a lot of time. Let, yeah. Let's roll back to something you said there, which is, you know, the good jobs with the good families only come occasionally. And then on the flip side, it also means that there are more jobs out there for families that you might not want to work for. And, and some of them, I always find, you know, they're like super urgent. They're like, oh, we need some next week. And I'm like, that's like a very big red flag for me, because that means mm -hmm. something went wrong and somebody left you flying, which means the relationship wasn't proper either direction, maybe. You know, it's a uh, yeah. So speak a little bit about your experience on what it means to have the right family or maybe the wrong family. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, first and foremost, when you're working in a private household is, you know, your relationship with a client and their family, depending on who you're working with. So that's the match because you're in their house. Obviously, it makes sense. But there's also the whole other side, the, the staffing as well. I, I tend to see more drama from that side sometimes than not. But I've been very fortunate. I've been work, I've been working with some great household staff, but I've seen some households where it's, it could be a little bit. Uh, actually, I've worked in one area where the house manager pretty much controlled everything. The principal was great. Um, but then you slowly start slowly realizing these things start happening. It's like, why is this not happening that way? And even there's generally in most households of this caliber or nature, there's an office too. And then when communication are bad, just like in anywhere, like a restaurant, whatever, you know something and you got to figure out where that's coming from. Um, so those are some red flags. And it's hard to know sometimes until you get there. But also if you've been in an industry long enough and you're, you know, obviously discreet, but you know, and you, I've met some people just, just casually um, through other people in other households. And they tell you the stories and, and they're not pulling punches because they're looking for work. So they're saying, hey, this is what's happening. And, and you always don't take it for face value from one person, but when you hear other people from the same household and they're looking, then you know. So I got one good story where I got called by a headhunter and they got my name from someone else and they're looking for a chef and obviously immediately. And they said, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry. No, thank you. And I, that's, that was that. And actually the office of this person actually called me directly too. And they said, you know, I know what you've heard, but now there's got, they have a, the principal has another chef that he only talks to. So you won't have to talk to the principal because I've heard that's difficult. I'm like, oh my God, you're telling me all this. And I said, yeah, no, thank you. Um, But they had, they were so in desperate need of someone that they had the headhunter. And when I passed, they had someone else, the, actually the HR office from that office call me. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's a red flag. Yeah, it's a big red flag. And, and I mean, it, it says a lot about what's going on in the household. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, and you've seen where the posting comes up and you kind of see the same posting sometimes, or I'll get a call. And this is the same thing. I get a call from various other people that know the principal and any other principal is great. They said, Oh, can you help finding someone else that's like you? Cause you, you know, we know that. And I'm like, yeah, that you, that person just called me. Another person just called me about it, you know, about a few months ago. So, you know, they're running through people. Yeah. So whether it's the principal, someone in the house staff, yeah, that's somewhat of a red, red flag. Yeah, I always like to point out, you know, that the interview is both ways and that you 
you as a candidate, as a chef, you also just want to make sure that you you know what you're getting into, you know, and that it's a great match for skill set, personality and character. Yeah. And I've also met on the opposite side, some chefs that are just like that I've heard through the vine from house managers, like, yeah, this guy do not like, you know, if I, let's say need someone to pick up you know, something, you know, or, or like work with me for an event or something, or, you know, if there's more guests coming, which happens obviously. And so you need like a sous chef, for instance, most of the time I've been the single um, chef in the the estate, whatever for the client. But sometimes I've heard, you know, these people's names go around chefs too, that have garnered a terrible reputation. So it goes both ways. You know what I'm saying? So I think for the listeners out there, for people that are listening, you know, you're, you're only as good as your last meal, your last movie, you know, those kinds of things that someone would tell me. And, and it is true. Cause you know, you always want to come out, you know, firing on all cylinders and, and do some good things. But as much as sometimes, you know, you've, we all know the, uh, the chef ego part, there are definitely people still out there. It just hasn't gone away with me too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And especially, I think in this industry, you also have only one name you know and that's kind of tied to your last position and it's it's a tough one if it's stained in the industry yeah i think in this industry too you know you can look up someone you know and, and you know talk to someone that's and they know who's worked for who you know if, if you said you've worked here as a guest chef yeah you know you know these people they exist so like yeah I, i think there's some people that kind of well they're over inflate or whatever but you know with the private chef i think it's different too i think when we're getting to this conversation i know people that love it like myself because i have a little more i have more time for myself and i've kind of created some of those situations but i think there's people that i know that love they called the show of the restaurant they wouldn't do anything else and i know people that have interviewed it and they're love for the restaurant you know the theatrics the table you know, all that stuff it's, it's a completely different animal um but i think it's it's always I think it works so much better if you've had that experience because obviously the people that we work for or I work for all go to restaurants of those calibers. They understand what service is. They understand what the food looks like or tastes like. So understanding that stuff, like, oh, you know, they'll go, oh, I had this at XX restaurant. Can you do the same thing? I was like, oh, yeah, I've, you know, I've worked there. I can, yeah, you want this? Sure. Or, you know, the chef that's worked or someone that's worked there and get the recipe or something at least close to it. So it's always good. But I think it definitely takes a little bit of time because I know some people that go back and forth, but just, I think it's like anything else, really understanding where you want to be or how you can shape it. Um, and nothing's ever perfect, but at least you can, you know, it's workable to where, you know, you can see some daylight, at least for me. So given both of the experiences or all the experiences you had, would you rather be a private chef or own a restaurant of your own? You know, I think I couldn't have one without the other, kind of what I was saying. Um, right now, I prefer the private chef. But without all the other experiences, I don't think I could be a good private chef. I think yeah. it's much difficult because I see people. And the interesting thing I always get is like, oh, I'm a private chef. Like, oh, how many clients do you have? I'm like, no, I'm not the one that's making box meals and running around, which is nothing wrong with that. But I can't be, I couldn't be what I'm saying of, a, of an individual client if I didn't do all those things yeah. of understanding a restaurant or pure, procuring things or I was a whole different set of skills like, you know, labor and management and things. Um, because at the end of the day, as a private chef, And most of the time it's you, you're, you know, you're, you're a solo team. You're like a golfer. You've got no one else to go at, yeah. you know, when you're working with a chef, it's the team and you're always the team because as much as sometimes you get the accolades and stuff, um, you know, really is putting the team together and the cooks and training them correctly to put out the dish, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that, that's, those are, like I said, there's pros and cons to all things, but I think at this point in time, it gives me a level of, you know, ease and calm because with the restaurant, there's just so many things. I mean, I, I you know, now it's like, I, especially with COVID. I mean, that's totally turned everything on its head. And as a disruptor, it could be good for some businesses, which it has been, um, like takeout, delivery, all those things. But it's also changed a lot of industries, like the restaurant industry in San Francisco. I know people that own like more mid-tiered restaurants and those are going away. People are leaving, number one, but also two in tech. Even if you made, like I said, this a few years ago, six figures in tech or out there, they're still rent so expensive that they're only affording places that are less expensive, like the pub, but they're younger. So they want a little more social. And that also changed the rental situation and how buildings are doing with more communal space and stuff and how they were looking at the way that world works. Or you have the really the high tech executive that's going to Saison and the things that are, you know, three Michelin and, and very expensive. So the middle, you know, was mostly saturated and all those started going out. Yeah. So my friend just has only one restaurant out of three now. So times change with the pandemic. So, you know, with 2008, I suffered that too. Like the restaurant I was, I was the chef at Post Rio San Francisco for Wolfgang, where I, I kind of started with them. You know, after the financial crisis, they threw a Hail Mary, tried to put me in there and I tried to resuscitate it. It was too difficult. And just, it just after that, that closed. So I was the last chef and, you know, time rolls on. So I've seen financial crises. So that's another reason why I went into private chefing because 
when you're the chef and you have to deal with all these things, you can only cut down so much, kind of like the companies are doing now. As, and I've seen so many talented skill chefs, like chefs that cook like amazingly, doesn't necessarily mean they can run a restaurant, which is a different story. But at the same time, like I thought, okay, my, I think my skill set would be a little bit geared toward private chefing after talking to my friends, you know, personable, can talk, you know, that kind of stuff. But then there's also the aspect where the amazing chefs can't be private chefs because just like you said, they're, they're not personal or they don't know how to talk and they don't have the right attitude to be in the household. Oh yeah. No, there's, there's plenty of those. And I think there's, yeah, there's some that work out really well. I've seen some work out because they have a kitchen that's off the main house and they're on their own, their own dishwasher. And the way. <laughs> yeah. And it can work out as long as, you know, everybody's different, but yeah, I think a lot of times, Because, you know, I mean, for us and for people that are not aware of what, what some of us do, we always prepare for more because you may have a guest that comes in. You always are not doing day by day. I think if you do, you you could lose out. They might want to change, right? You know, have their favorite. I want this or that. So you always have to have those things in mind. You always have to have like a sixth sense and understand what the flow is. Yeah. Just like any place else, but it, it's really understanding and being anticipatory And that's why, you know, great restaurants are great restaurants or great services, great service, because you're anticipating their needs. And some chefs can't see that. They're like, no, this is the way it is. You know, this is what we're doing. But um, when you're working at someone else's house, it's like, it's, it's your house. Like, I'm here to just make things move, move a little smoother, be a little better, you know, creating some value, you know, great value for them of why you're there. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something to where, you know, the chef ideally would like to nail everything down on the menu for a week. <laughs> And then the family is like 3.30 p.m. Like, why don't we do this for dinner instead? And you're like, oh, well, I don't even have the ingredients. But yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, I, I've been forgotten about one time. So another funny story is like, okay, so, you know, send the menu and everything's approved. You know, doing, okay, great. Time is generally the same unless they change it. I'm working on it. And then all of a sudden there's pizza coming up delivery and the principal goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you were here. You know what? I can put this pizza away. And you, I'm like, you know what? No problem. I, let me just put all this away. I'll be out of your way. Are you sure it's okay? Absolutely. And it happens, you know, yeah. You know, I've like been I said, there. when the sushi yeah, delivery just, guy came. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and like no harm, no foul, but I think some chefs would be just like, Oh my God, you know, but you're like, You're working for them. It's all, it's all there, you know, and you try to do your best, but sometimes you have to be honest. Like sometimes they, um, you know, it's good. That's why I'm saying it's good working for people that, you know, you gel with or understand or conscientious, or even if they do make it say, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I forgot about that. Um, and sometimes you remind them, but you know, there's times where you say, you know, I need this for 10 right now. It's like, you know, I can't do for 10. I got for eight because you got an hour and I can't really run to the store. There's times where there's limitations or sometimes you cut a thing smaller, but sometimes there's not, you know, they appreciate the honesty, but it doesn't happen too often. And it's, it's only, you know, when they ask something, something like I need a truffle now, like I can't, I can't get a truffle right now. It's not a season or something like that. You know, uh, you try your best, but that's why frozen comes in handy. You know, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Always got a little truffle frozen right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but you're right, you know, there there have been so many uh, instances where I was happy about one or two lobster tails in the freezer because, you know, oh, can't you can't you whip up something real quick? Just a, just a few snacks and you don't have any premium items and you have guests and you're like, uh, sure, you know, and you just just got to be flexible. You have to. I mean, you have to, um, you know, part of it, you know, it's interesting because I've worked with people to help them out, especially newer clientele that's you know, come into some wealth and you know, setting up a kitchen and things. But, you know, as the private chef too, you know, you want to set up whoever's coming in to be successful. But yeah, the freezers, you know, you know, we're talking about it's in this situation where you work as a private chef, it helps out a lot. Like just having your stocks or your glasses, because at any moment, like somebody's coming up or, you know, the, the client's favorite steak, you know, you can't be running out in the middle and they want something, you know, you have to have certain, and you get a feel for the client, obviously, you're not just putting it haphazardly, but I think those are the things that, you know, in that kind of position of private chef, you want to be on top of it and just basically not say no, you yeah. know, that, that's where, I, that's where my heart is coming from, like, you know, put the best quality possible. And sometimes, you know, the clients I've worked for, they don't really give you a time. It's like 12 or one. And sometimes it's like 1159. So you're always ready a little earlier, but sometimes they want to even eat earlier and you just have to sometimes make it the best you can, you know? Yeah. And sometimes uh, you think it's 1159, but it's really 1.30 PM. 
<laughs> yeah. So you just have to. Okay. You know, you say, okay, coming. Yes. Gotta this is a very a funny bit. one because one of my friends and, and he just uh, spent the summer in the Côte d'Azur cooking, cooking for a family. And then he was like, sometimes I wonder what people think about how food works. They walk around the corner and say, I'm ready now. And then they think you just serve it hot. Yeah. You know, and, and it, that, that's a funny one. That's why I always try to have a small snacks that I can just drop right then and there because that allows me or gives me time to actually cook everything else as fresh as possible, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's important. You get a feel of who's in the house, the schedule when it's coming, which is a whole other part of this, the private chef game is, you know, talking to assistants or understanding what their flow is. If they're coming on back from vacation, some people I work, they're coming vacation. They've eaten too much. They want to lighten down. So you know that your menus are going to have to be a little more health friendly or things like that, or at least for a few days. That's the regular you one. Know, yeah. So it goes back, <laughs> so it goes back in order. Um, you know, portion size though is another one, you know, so they can always ask for more is what I say. You know what I mean? You can always ask for more. You don't want to be like, Oh my God, it's so much, <laughs> you know, like, Oh, that's delicious. Can I get more? That's more than what you want to hear. <laughs> So yeah. little things that I always think about. Did you, did you have, uh, ever have to do like the whole calorie counting thing and keep track of every I, gram on the blade? No, no. Thankfully I had one obviously with special diets and it was very interesting because it was the, it was like eating for your blood. So like my whole list of I couldn't do was huge, but like I had to do, basically I made like like tomato sauce without tomatoes, but I use squash and like, I could only use lemons and no vinegar and obviously any kind of herb that I made it taste like pasta sauce. I don't remember how, but I did. Um, but yeah, I've had some challenging things like that or like, yeah, it's been kind of an interesting journey, but you know, I'll tell you what, when you work with clients like that, your cooking does get better because you actually have to think you're not just using like, Oh, okay. This is, you know, you can sear this or braise this, you know, you get that all that stuff. Now you're like, Oh my God, how do I turn this into this? Yeah. How do you turn six courses into like one ingredient, you know, which was kind of in fashion for a little while, but the bean, you know, it's like azuki beans or something. That's one of the things that they could eat, but they want to like, you know, six different, seven different things based upon it and yeah. in different type of cuisine flavor. So you're like, okay, you get really good at it. Even if you have a dehydrator or whatever else you're like, Oh my God, can I dehydrate that? Can I juice it? Can I, what else can I do with it? <laughs> what else can I do? What are it? all the textures I could possibly do with this one ingredient? Yeah, I know. It's like, Oh my God, it gets to a point where you're like, Oh, it's a little, it's a little crazy, but you know, you make it work, you know, sometimes you have to add a little bit more oil to make it taste like something, you know, to make it feel like something in your mouth, but you know, it's, it's what happens. <laughs> so, but I think especially for private chef being flexible around dietary needs is super crucial. And at least from what I'm hearing from the agencies, more and more of healthy and kind of conscious alternatives are in demand. So that's definitely something to hone in on for everybody that wants to move from the restaurant into the private sector. That those are the things that where people keep an eye on and where they might prefer your resume over. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're shopping, and that's another big part of our, our jobs is to shop is always looking at what's new and tasting it too. Like, you know, even chips and snacks. Cause remember, it's not like you're in a restaurant where you're kind of setting up your, you know, your appetizer starters, all that kind of stuff. You're looking at snacks that these people might enjoy. So you want to give them something new too, right? Especially with kids or something, they're trying to introduce something in their meal. So, you know, you're always trying to, which in the private household is, is great too, because it kind of flexes your mind a little bit, but you're absolutely right. You know, when you're working for a higher end clientele and they have a, a dinner over, they and emails you over from their assistant like what likes or dislikes and then especially if 10 people you're not necessarily doing each individual stuff but you're not just want to give them oh i'm vegetarian just give them like the bowl of pasta you know that's that's the the requisite hate uh, especially now with so much intrigue going on with you know vegan vegetarian it has been for some time yeah you don't want to be stuck doing there oh okay here you go here's a you salad know, the crazy <laughs> thing is the first restaurant i worked at ever and it was back in germany we didn't even have vegetarian options it wasn't a thing mm -hmm. back then i mean it was also in bavaria so maybe a bit more meat heavy but <laughs> like when we had literally it was a michelin star restaurant and if a vegetarian would come in we would not have a written menu we would need to make it on the fly and yeah. that, that was interesting to see the progression that then, then i went to spain you know and at least we had vegetarian options and then i came mm -hmm. to new york and suddenly it's like yeah you absolutely have to have that stuff you know it's like it's no way around it 
Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's funny because being California, there's a lot more health conscious. So there's always salads or, you know, especially Wolfgang, he made popular like the chopped salad, for instance. I mean, I don't think it's his creation, but it became popularized and he called it Chino Farms salad, which Chino Farms is famous for Alice Waters using and Frank Chino down on Rancho Santa Fe. But, you know, there were things that became fashionable because people would order it and it's not on the menu. So people would know we always have that stuff. So it's kind of a fun thing and kind of a, a marketing thing at the same time without it really being purposeful marketing. Um, same with the pizzas. But yeah, I think California is a little more where this crudite or grilled vegetables was one part of the puzzle. But then we started constructing things more, you know, whether it's fillings with more, you know, corn or peas, you know, just all kinds of different things, broths and things you were playing around with. But definitely California is much more prevalent in, in, than back in the 90s and then evolved to obviously vegetarian, vegan tasting menus. And, and now, you know, new techniques, making cheeses that are the and things which are pretty incredible um so yeah i think um there's some people that really specialize in that stuff and clients that are looking specifically for those things but yeah it is very good to keep that skill level in terms of uh, dietary restrictions yeah and i think those also make the difference i i feel like if you are specialized in something and you you can deliver outstanding service on it it will also make a difference in the demand for you as a chef and ultimately that reflects in your pay too yeah i think it's interesting too you know and obviously is you know with the pay and stuff it's a certain amount of years work it wants stability in the household but i think it's interesting to cooking wise, you know, I get asked all the time, especially new people that I meet, oh, what's your what's your dish that you cook? And and for me, when you're working private, it's like or anytime now as you, you know, been cooking for a while, it's like pretty much what the clients are looking for. You know, I yeah. you you adapt. It's like if if they're happy with this a grilled steak, great. But if they're happy with some, you know, vegetable that's done seven different ways, and then so be it. That's that's great too. So I'll cook that, you know, and figure out a different way to do that. So but I think um you're right, flexibility is 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 tantamount with all things personal personality and, and just the way you cook well you, you can't be too flexible on your personality but you need to be accommodating <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess that's true i guess there's something cemented a certain way and i guess <laughs> yeah either you're one way or the other i think yeah well i think there is there is a good fit and like one time i was at an interview in a on the upper east side and the interview was like in a library with like chinese ming vases and i was like i already knew that i'm not the guy for this position <laughs> Before I met the principal. <laughs> yeah, some of the descriptions out there too, like I look at them, you know, you get the alert. Some of them are just like, yeah, not for me, not for me. Oh, it could be. Um, but yeah, it, it, some of it just like, oh man. But I think it's always good to have an idea what kind of personalities gel together, what client you could see yourself working for. Because, you know, a lot of the newer people trying to break into it, it's difficult for them because they don't know these things. They're always oh, this normal or like, and vice versa, people that they're working for that are new with this too, like, you know, how they're charging for or how they're getting paid for groceries they're paying out of their own pocket if it's that kind of case you know how soon should i be paid or what should i be charging it's like what are they asking you to do uh you know how much are you traveling so you know i've been fortunate most of the time it's been you know a salaried position where it's all inclu inclusive but there are other offshoots of it which i think people think more than norm as doing working for a bunch of clients is what i think i guess when people ask me that are not aware of kind of what we do all the time yeah that's actually that's a, a market that i've never been interested in to to go you know meal delivering and all of those filling up fridges services that was never right down my alley i i kind of liked to you know deliver proper meals in a proper setting for ideally one family yeah there was a before i started the one the, my first private chef job in new york there's a well-known chef that actually was doing that and in, in a healthy way and getting clients like that for the high-end clients and dropping meal delivery off of a certain type of diet it's kind of interesting yeah and then i called them up i'm like hey i'm i'm here now thanks XYZ chef. It's like, oh, I didn't know you were there. I'm like, I didn't know you were doing this. It's like, yeah, doing things. It was kind of interesting. I don't think he does it anymore though. But I think I think it's it's logistically there's a lot going into those deliveries too. You know, it's not as straightforward. And I think from the cost, otherwise, you know, it would be, I think it would be a, a lot more chefs doing it. It's not easy to do it in, in New York City, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you know, I've gotten calls and asking to do things like that, like drop off. And, and they're like hiring clients and just, it's just a need, right? They're in between or need something for the office or that office isn't equipped to do things, which now, now is, uh, as you know, more of the hedge funds and stuff, they have meal services. So that's a whole nother section of private chefing too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting because I like, likewise too, I was never interested, but it does come up because there are people that want in a certain way and know about, you know, the way you've been taking care of someone else. No, because they have guests that come like, oh, that's, they talk sometimes like, can I have that or whatever? So it's good 
good to know that, you know, it's a, such a sub market, but they, those things do exist. So what I'm saying is people are thinking outside the box and, you know, there are things that exist as, as it comes up, but it's not like the main stream of, of what we do, yeah. I think. So given that you also were on channels like the Food Network and shows like Job, um, do you think that that really helped your branding and your positioning in the industry? No, not in Private Chef. I, I think, you know, what's funny is, so one of my principal's kids' friends noticed me when I was cooking in the kitchen, like, oh, hey, I know him from Chop. But other than that, the principal's they don't care. I mean, the ones that I work for, could give could care less. As long as what they got on the plate is what they're looking for, and yeah. it's on time and all that stuff. I, that's what it, I chopped is good because like, it's more for, you know, if you're doing a restaurant, it's like even top chef, like, you know, it's like, if you have a restaurant and stuff, it's definitely gonna help you with your marketing. Cause even on chopping, when I get an episode airs, like, Oh, where can I try your food? I'm like, unless you're high in that work, <laughs> it's not going to yeah, happen. Write me a big check. For- I, don't, I don't say that. I don't say that, but yeah, but you know, it, it is hard because when you say, you know, it's also too, it's funny in the competition. Like when I started the competition, I said nothing about my background. I just said private chef and I'm like, oh, okay. And some of the episodes were just private chef episode. And I'm like, and you know, some are good and some are just, that's what they've been doing and not working in the other restaurants. But like I said, I, you know, we are who we are, you know, because we've worked in some, you know, fine dining places. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of that, no, I mean, it's fun to be able to do and, and to win and to hold a, another part of the culinary scene. Like for me, I think I like exploring different things. So there's a whole nother, after I started doing those competitions, I got like messages to compete in like national competitions. That's not my thing either, but I, I didn't realize there's a, whole thing for me it's just okay it's tv it's a little bit more because i did like the tv aspect because you know when i was working for wolfgang he had the wolfgang puck show um and so it's fun being in studio and you know i got some exposure to that um so it's really fun doing that and obviously watching food network you know i kind of grew up on that too like oh that's cool i can do that a lot of chefs say i can do that so i'm like okay now i'm here let me do that but um yeah as far as far as private chef it's it, it doesn't mean a whole whole lot but it is fun you know it's for other things but so for someone coming up what would you say is one of the most crucial pieces to the puzzle maybe in their resume or in their first application that really gives them a chance you know, it's hard in our industry and for private chefs specifically, which is the really the hard thing about this industry. And I don't always agree, but it, it's longevity. Like a lot of these people want to see six years, sometimes five years minimum. They'll say it. It depends, you know, and it's kind of structure of a salary, high net worth person, you know, six, six years and stuff as a, as a private chef or private chef experience, because what private chef experience means to me is, you know, you've worked in a household, you've worked with the staff, you know, you know, you're in someone's home, you know, you're not just coming out of the restaurant going, okay, here you go. When's this, you know? happening like let's go let's get it on guys you know screaming at people in the yeah, house <laughs> yeah there's no expo expo hey hey yeah a fire table 25 like you know no it's none of that it's so <clears throat> there's got to be some finesse going or you know but the, i mean that's the tricky part right so for people transitioning from the restaurant obviously they don't have those five years so making that exactly. first step that's always where they they look at the requirements and like well how could i possibly have five years if nobody's tr- willing to give me one year you know in the case of most most things in this world it's sometimes who you know not what you know um and so that's you know Obviously, I, I, it's who I knew and what I knew helped me get there. But in that case, it's just, you know, making sure, you know, whatever that principal is looking for, the job you're applying for, it matches in a way, the cuisine and all that, you know, the stuff. If you don't have experience, get what you can that matches to go there. And on the second round, you know, if you've worked at some great restaurants and you haven't got your foot in the door, those restaurants, and if you've got a good reputation there, they always call those people. Like they're calling whatever Michelin star restaurant say, Hey, do you have a chef? And they'll write sometimes if they've got someone and it's a personal friend, it'll, it'll happen sometimes. Cause I know people that are not working and, um, you know, there's, there's great, there's actually, there's jobs all the way around in private chefs. It's just kind of getting into the the spot of knowing some of these people that you've worked with, especially if you're in a high end, want to be in a higher end situation. You know, those people are, are always working in those restaurants. And even so now, I mean, during COVID, so many calls are going out to the Michelin star, you know, the, the guys are working so hard like ourselves and wanting to do something different. So I know people are asking, Hey, do you know any other people that would want to work this job? And we like these restaurants. And that's a whole other thing. Like, which restaurants do you like? What restaurants do you eat out at? So you know what kind of cuisine they're they're into you don't want to match someone that's doing you know french if they really don't like french and like asian so 
um, be true. And that, that's a crucial piece to the puzzle, I think, is also, you know, being aware that as a candidate, as a chef, you know, make sure that your skill set, the cuisine matches and don't be disheartened if you're if you don't land a job, even in the first five or 10, because everybody's looking for a good fit. And you will, if you have the skill set of these kind of kitchens we're talking about, you will eventually find a family that will appreciate your skill set, but it might take some time to, to get there. Yeah. Absolutely. And along the way, you learn things. So, you know, I end up doing a little bit of house management and things like that. And you find ways. And that's the experience after you get your foot in the door. But getting your foot in the door, you're absolutely right. You have to be, a, you know, a fit or at least a fit on paper to begin with um, and not get discouraged and, you know, just keep working on your craft because, you know, the next job you take may segue into that if you're working somewhere, um, you know, that people like to go out and eat depending on the clientele, what you want to do. Because like I said, there's people that want to do the meal service and that's great. And then there's people that like ourselves that are just doing, you know, one client, you know, positions. And I think what you also said is about, you know, you need to have a good relationship with the restaurants you worked at before. Like you need to be a, a version of yourself that people like to recommend to other people. Like if you don't have raving fans, either in your, in your restaurant jobs or in your private chef positions, you don't really have a recommendation. Absolutely. Because, you know, like any group, they're all in the same mix, right? The people that you cook for, that we cook for. They're eventually going to say, oh, and they talk to each other. It's not like, you know, oh, okay, I'm looking for someone. They always ask me, and that's how I've gotten a lot of my referrals. And some of them haven't worked out, but I've done so well by some of my principals. And they, and then when I didn't work for them anymore, whatever circumstance, they've always given me recommendations beyond the scenes. So I've gotten calls from friends of, of my ex-principals looking for someone. And I, I feel great because that's the recommendation that I don't need a paper. I don't need a letter of. It's him directly telling, oh, you need a chef. His food's not very good. And then he needs to get together with my chef to call somebody or, or we know this person. And that's kind of how it works. So you're absolutely right. Your reputation, if it's there, then other principals like that you've worked with and have a good relationship will call on your behalf or say, hey, you know, you should give this person a call, which is amazing, which I haven't heard that happen to too many people. So I've been fortunate in that sense that I've done something right. Well, that's all your dedication and your hard work, you know, and keeping growing. And what you said earlier, you know, you got to be tuned in and intuitive and service people and, you know, not beyond. So if you deliver that kind of service, I think that's that's well um, deserved. Yeah. No, I think, you know, I learned early on too, um, doing some, you know, high end catering and stuff. And this is from learning through mistakes is you always try to leave the place that you, that you're working even for that day better than you found it. So even if you're doing a tasting and there's things there and look, you know, clean it up a little bit, you know, whatever it may be, not throwing anything out that you don't know, but just in the sense that always like when you look at your workspace and obviously it comes from working in higher end restaurants, you're always trying to keep your space very clean. But I think that goes a long way too. just making sure your environment, you're leaving it better than you found. And that's, it's always worked well for me. So I think that's always good. And you always get comment, oh, the, whatever the housekeeper, whatever is going on with, you know, you, you work so clean and work. Yeah. So yeah, good. But I clean up after myself and you need to make sure you're not making some other mess for somebody else too. Cause it's not just you, house staff and et cetera. And the principal walks in and he wants to get, you know, his, soda or whatever or drink you know you want to make sure that the handle's clean you know the, the things that you would want in your own home but you have to think outside you know what i mean those things yeah the, those little details you know mm -hmm. you use the same fridge handle which which doesn't immediately translate but you know make sure those details yeah, I mean, are clean so that when the principal yeah, uses it it's clean you know it's it sounds simple but it's it's yeah, those details that the water make bottles the i mean just to make it look like it's you know uh, high-end market is just the things, what they're going to see is, you know, what they're going to see. So you have to kind of, like I said, be intuitive and, and be attentive and look what they would walk into, you know, as the floor that they're walking in, you know, is that, you know, make sure it's clean, make sure, you know, the smell or something. You have fish, make sure the garbage is clean. You make sure the, you know, all those little things that you don't think about, but that could just turn one thing to, you know, that one time to always leave it in a better shape than you found it. Even if the, someone else left it there, doesn't matter. Yeah. Definitely don't don't leave the fish in the garbage when you don't <laughs> yeah. know who brings it out later yeah. and you're not there tomorrow. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chef, um, one of my favorite questions that I usually like to ask to wrap it up is, um, what does it mean to you to have a life well lived? You know what? It's changed over the years, but currently, um, 
it's having more time for myself and my family, which I think equates to freedom. And really, that's what I've been trying to work on the most. But I think that's a life well lived is where I have free time for myself. I mean, that was a luxury. I'll tell you a story. For me too, the way I can relate to it is there's a whole point in my life that pop culture is completely missing because I didn't do anything but work in the kitchen. I don't know the movies from that era, the songs, the TV shows, nothing. Because all I would see was the kitchen from day and night to the point where it's like, yeah, you that's all you did. I went into work at like nine and then got out sometimes at two. So, and that's sometimes six days a week. So one day is off, I'm hanging out, you know, yeah. with friends or whatever, at younger age partying, but then now, yeah. So what I equate to is like, well, I'm working so hard to do. And that's why what I think too is being flexible of mindset is finding other ways to um, do things that you love and find the time to be able to do other things that you love as well. That's a life well lived. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And and I think anybody who works on that level in anything, it could be a, a top athlete or a top chef, you know, there is a price to pay. And it's like you said, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of hours and it's giving up on maybe knowing what's been on TV and the music and all of that, because it takes that level of dedication to get to Absolutely. that level. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you know, that's something that's in you and you, you can't take. So as long as you can keep using that and understanding that kind of energy to in a healthy way to do other things, you know, you're, you're upping your chances of success. And I think that's where, and then being able to spend more time with, you know, loved ones, like, you know, it's like giving, if you have more time to give to the right things, you know, more of that stuff can come back. And that's kind of, you know, what I was missing for so long where, you know, all you're doing is working. It's like, Oh, I'm going to be this chef or do this stuff. And then finally, kind of, when you hit those goals and you realize, okay, that was great. That was good. So what's the next chapter? What's the next plan? So, But I think you have a lot of different goals and keep them moving around. And that mind is like, you know, with the freedom, there's a lot of things that come into creating that. Um, but luckily enough to say that it's starting to happen and, and I'm doing other things as well, which really enable that to happen. So I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Cease. This was an amazing conversation. Where can people connect with you either? <laughs> If they want to hire you as a private oh, chef, for that. Oh, no, it, was, it was wonderful. And like your resume is amazing. So thanks for asking me um, to join you. Um, so they can find me. I put a blog out. It's um, chefsace.com. Um, and at chefsace is my Instagram, which I'm probably most active at. I haven't gotten to the TikTok thing, even though people said I should. I just, you know. And then sometimes you can catch me on Food Network. Sometimes the show is on because it's actually a popular episode. So when it comes on, I'll see the spike. Um, but yeah, chefsace.com or at chefsace. <laughs> you can find me there. Awesome. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us at the Private Chef Podcast. If you know any highly skilled chefs that want to take their life to the next level, make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you enjoyed this episode, click subscribe and check out our upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.